Thank you so much, Evan. What a beautiful song. Open the eyes of my heart. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Bellevue Baptist Church. I'm so glad you're able to join us this morning, live and in color, as we worship the Lord together. And this week, I've been thinking about um, how God uses events in our life so we can get closer to him. And I've been thinking about revival and praying for it in our lives and in our church. So this morning, our first song has something to do with that. It's called, I Feel Like Something Good's About to Happen. Here we go. Sing along. I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of Brother, it could happen any day when God's people humble themselves and call on Jesus and they look to heaven expecting as they pray. I just feel like something good is about to happen. And brother, this could be that very day. I have learned in all that happens just to praise him. He's working all things for my good. Every tear I shed is worth all the investment. For I know he'll see me through, he said he would. He has promised I your ear can hardly fathom all the things he has in store for those who pray. I just feel like something good is about to happen. It could happen any day When God's people humble themselves and call on Jesus And they look to heaven expecting as they pray I just feel like something good is about to happen And brother, this could be that very day Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for today. Father, to wake up, um, to be alive here on, on your creation, Lord. Father, we're thankful for the beautiful day that you blessed us with yesterday, 80 degrees and sunny and not a cloud in the sky, Lord. It's just a testament of, of your mercy and grace to us and your love for us, Lord, that even amidst um, complete chaos in our lives, that um, a beautiful day like that can completely change, change our perspective, Lord. And we're just thankful for, for that, Father. And Lord, we know that something good is about to happen. It may not be in the next week, it may not be in the next month, Lord, but we're certain that um, because of you and your love for us that something great is going to happen. It already has. Uh, your son already bore the cross and bore our sins, Lord, um, and, and that free gift of eternity with you, Lord, that's already been, it's already happened, and we have that, Father, and we're thankful for it, Lord. We just ask that you be with our church and our community at this time, be with our country, as we try to make some tough decisions on what we should do in the next uh, coming weeks, Lord. Father, I just pray that you'd be with those people who are making those decisions, be with all the ones who have been affected by this, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. I just got to start saying it. I'm sorry. I, I can't help it. It's just like part of me. Uh, good morning, church. We're excited to have everybody. We're excited to have everybody that's here. Our, our, we're so blessed to have an awesome uh, staff that continues to come in and perform awesome music for us. I guess got to say awesome. I'm excited. Um, so and we're just uh, we're excited to have everybody that's that's tuned in. Um, if, if you want to drop who you are, where you're from in the comment section down there. If you're a first time viewer, we really want to get to know you, um, find out where you're from. If there's anything we can pray for you about, just drop that in the comments as well. Um, we don't have any any great grand announcements. I will tell you that um, the governor has announced the, the phases and everything that we're supposed to be following, um, and we are going to, the deacons will be meeting this Thursday um, virtually and discussing what our plans should be and how we're going to go about um, reopening uh, our sanctuary for services and everything. So just pray for us as we make those decisions. 
Um, we we want to open up the doors as soon as we can, but we want to make sure that we're doing it as safe as possible. So um, just pray for us and pray for the rest of our church and our community at this time. Um, we're I want to also say that uh, if you didn't tune in last week, um, we mentioned that uh, we got we put together some numbers about about our, our tithes and offering offerings at this during this time, and we were pretty. Um, we were just amazed at, at your selflessness um, to continue to give during this time of hardship. Um, and we just want to say how thankful we are here at Bellevue um, for your generosity at the, during this time. Um, and we just pray that you continue to uh, seek the Lord's uh, guidance in, in what it is that, that, you should, that you should be doing at this time and how you're going to continue to give. If you would like to give, there are four ways that you can do that, and they are listed there on the website. Um, there is a address there that you can send them to. Um, there is a big green box at the top of the web at the, of the home page that you can click on, and it will prompt you on how to put your information in and tie that way. Um, and then there's a cell phone number that you can text. And then the fourth, there is an app called the Tidely app, and that is um, you download the app, and it is super easy just to put all your information in there, submit how much you want to 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 tithe, and and it'll process it for you. Um, and you can even set up reoccurring tithing if you would like, um, and you'll get a receipt and everything in your email um, so that you can track it all, and it's pretty pretty cool. Um, and I think we're going to be sending out some information about our um, – because we haven't had business meetings or anything, so we're going we're gonna to be sending out a, a, some paperwork to everybody about um, our, our numbers, and there should be some, some information in there about the Tidely app um, and what it's going to be in the future. I think that's all I have, Brother James. You ready to play some more music? Sure. All right, let's do it. Thank you, Brother TJ, for those awesome announcements. Our next hymn this morning is a favorite of Bellevue's, and um, we're going to sing it. It's called It Is Well With My Soul. Here we go. One, two.
all God's people said, amen. Now we've got a special treat for us this morning. We're going to have our cameraman, Miss Jessie Rowland, and her brother Zach accompany her on the guitar, and they're going to sing a little duet for us. And while they're getting ready, I just wanted to um, say that if any of our members of our choir would like to come down and be part of our service and sing special music, um, we would love to have you. Just give me a call or send me a text this week. I haven't heard from any of you in the last three weeks. So just want to <laughs> I just want to say that you are more than welcome to come down and join us to sing a special. We already have eight people here, so we could only have one or two more to, to satisfy the quota of ten as laid by the government. So we're going to turn it over now to Jesse and Zach. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some, but right now, oh, I'm losing that. I stood on the stage night after night, reminding the broken. easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down what will i say when i'm held to the flame like i am right now i know you're able and i know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand but even if you don't my hope is you Thanks so much, Zach and Jesse, and uh, welcome everyone to 
our Sunday morning service. Uh, it's exciting to have you, as TJ said. I would have you turn now, if you would, in your Bible to Acts chapter 16. Uh, the song that these two just sang is potent and no doubt inspired by passages from Scripture like Job. And uh, I think of the end of Habakkuk in particular. It wouldn't be a shocker to find out that the song is inspired by these lines. Uh, of course, if you have been tuning into our Wednesday night Bible studies, they're, they're all available on YouTube for you to look at uh, after the fact if you didn't get to see them. But I, through several weeks, I think seven or eight, uh, went through the book of Habakkuk, and that just concluded this past Wednesday night. And we'll be starting a new Bible study, only this time we're going to attempt the live route of um, having everybody on there and me being able to mute you at will like a dictator, but, you know, allowing people to ask questions and offer up prayer requests. So we're going to try that this coming Wednesday night, and, and you'll see more information for that. But throughout the study of Habakkuk, uh, the prophet Habakkuk is living in a time when, when there's rampant wickedness in Israel, in Judah. And he's praying to God, saying, God, why are you allowing this to happen? And in so many words, he says, God, why are you asleep at the wheel? He asks very bold questions of God. God, why do you allow your own people to trample uh, your name underfoot and trample the orphan and the widow in society underfoot? Injustice is everywhere. And God responds that he is going to send judgment in the form of a foreign army called the Chaldeans. And there's a conversation that goes back and forth between Habakkuk and the Lord. And at the conclusion, Habakkuk has made this incredible arc from being someone who questioned whether God was even paying attention to things to someone who was able to admit that God's ways are higher than his ways. And he says these words at the end of his prophecy. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fall, fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's, and he makes me tread on my high places." So it's just a beautiful, beautiful text, and uh, it reminds us of that line from the song you just heard, uh, even if you don't. You know, even if God doesn't deliver us the way we want to be delivered, our hope is still in Him alone, which is relevant for our passage today in Acts chapter 16. This morning, we'll be talking about three paths to God. Three paths to God. Let me get my water out here. I have to announce it or I'll spill it trying to act... Uh, you know, smooth and sneaky. If you're wondering why I'd title a sermon Three Paths to God when there is, in fact, one path to God, then you're already catching on to the point. These three paths to God that we're going to learn about today are, at the, in the end, illegitimate. They promise hope, but they cannot deliver hope. And we see this incredible scene where the Apostle Paul is in the city of ancient Philippi, and he encounters three individuals. Um, as you're turning there to Acts 16, I just wanted you to use your imagination for a moment with me. Imagine that you could go back to like the year 60 AD, you know, 30 years maybe after Jesus has risen from the grave. Christianity is at its most nascent uh, beginning state, and people are meeting in small house churches and reading scripture to one another and preaching the truth. Um, all the scripture they have, of course, is the Old Testament. And imagine a Bible study where a few people have gathered together to just read the Psalms. These are new Christians, and they've gathered together in a house, and there are three individuals and yourself. And you were just a week ago offering sacrifices to uh, false gods as a Greek person, but you were introduced to Jesus Christ through a friend, and now your life has changed forever. So you're sitting in this Bible study, and there are two women there, and there's a man there, and, and there's you. And uh, one at a time, you go around the room, sort of introducing yourselves to each other and explaining how did you get to this place? How did you go from wherever you were to where you are now? Strangely, an extraordinary minority in society sitting in this little room, reading scripture together, through the lens that God has accomplished all that he promised to in the Old Testament through the person of Jesus. So one at a time, uh, you have a woman speak up, and she says, 
uh, I, was, I was attempting to worship God, but what I found was that my worship of God was self-righteous. And I found that I was really putting more pride and effort into myself and that my worship was a legalistic worship. But then I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and discovered what it was like to be free from the burden of the law, him having taken it on his shoulders on the cross. And now I live for my Lord. And the next person speaks up. She says, just recently, I was possessed with demons. I did anything my masters made me do, whether the, they, those masters were the demons living inside me or my worldly masters who were using me to, for, as financial gain. And then someone came along and proclaimed aloud the name of Jesus, and these spirits came out of me. And I can't tell you exactly how this happened. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. And everything has changed forever now because of that. And then the third individual speaks up, and it's a man, and he said that I was filled with fear. I didn't know who to trust, and I didn't know what to believe. And in the scariest moment of my life, I turned my sword to my own throat, and I was stopped just short of taking my life in the, in the midst of my despair and hopelessness, and the name of Jesus Christ was invoked in my midst. When it was spoken, I ran to my knees and asked, what must I do to be saved? Christ entered my heart. My family became followers of Christ, and now everything has changed for us. And so you're sitting in this little room with three under, other individuals, and you're all ha you all have different backgrounds and different stories, and you're an extraordinary minority in society, but you have a bond with one another now that cannot be broken, and it's all connected by the name of Jesus. I'll mention that hypothetical Bible study later on at the end of the sermon, but as you turn now to Acts chapter 16, we're going to look at three pathways to God. In Acts chapter 16, verse, uh, if we go down to verse 11, we're going to start reading in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to uh, just share an illustration of a story I read once. And I've shared this with the church before. Uh, in the 1800s, when people from the Western world, before, um, before the modern times, of course, where we have modern technology and GPS mapping, when people wanted to travel over to China or to the easternmost parts, what we would consider, because we're Westerners, the easternmost part of the earth, or if they wanted to go to India, then they would set sail from England or from Spain or from France, and they had two options. They could either go straight south around the bottom corner there of Africa and then eastward all the way to China or India. That path was treacherous, and that path was also very, very long. And so people would take what was called uh, the Northwest Passage. The Northwest Passage is when you're setting sail from England or you're setting sail from, the, from Europe, you go north to the northernmost part of Canada where the continent that is North America and which is today com composed of uh, the United States and Canada, Canada eventually starts breaking up the further you get to the North Pole into these islands and it creates a, pa a passage that you could run your finger through on a map today. And if you could make it through that passage, then you would come out at the Pacific Ocean into China, and then you could go and trade and, and experience the financial benefits of reaching that side of the earth and then coming back with, with rare spices and other goods. Uh, the story I read explained how these, these sailors on a ship all got together in a room. They noticed that the weather was changing rapidly as they came through the Northwest Passage and that the water was freezing so quickly that they had to make important decisions or they were going to get stuck in the ice in the middle of nowhere and be exposed to the elements until they starve out uh, or exposed to diseases, get scurvy, or are killed by wild beasts like like a polar bear. And so they get together in this room and they're trying to decide what to do. And you have the good option, you have the better option, and you have the best option. And everybody is arguing back and forth until finally they arrive at the best possible option. This is the route we should take. It will keep us from being frozen by the ice that is chasing behind us and trying to catch the ship as the weather pattern changes here in the Northwest Passage. And when they're finished with their entire debate and discussion and they determine the path to take, the captain stands up and in the presence of everyone says, well, I guess we're going to take the good option. At which point everyone's jaws hit the floor 
And they stare at him, bewildered that he didn't hear the entire conversation they just had with one another. The best option had been explained, and the captain said, no, we're going to do the one that could cost us the most, but has the chance of being the fastest to get over to China and the other areas that we're trying to reach. Everyone's bewildered because what was once a few options became the option of death or the option of life. If they took the option that the captain is proposing, they would certainly die and be stranded. If they took the better option, they had a chance of making it. And the captain said, we're taking the worst option. And it should come as no surprise that what happens in the story is that they are frozen in the ice and that the men are dying in droves from the very things that I mentioned earlier and not, not surviving as their supplies are running out. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, later on in verse 27, also says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, one that turns us away from the snares of death. The book of Proverbs frequently talks about just two paths. Not a good, better, and best, but just, just two paths. The path of righteousness, the path of justice, the path where your love is for God, your love is for yourself, and your love is for your neighbor, and it always leads to life. And the other path that the book of Proverbs talks about is the path that leads to death. And it always involves uh, the defamation of God's name. It always involves, like I said, trampling the orphan and the widow or the most vulnerable in society underfoot. And it always involves promoting oneself and consequently includes death every time. This binary view that there are not many pathways, but there's just two choices. Death, life or death, is one that's clear to us also in the gospel. You can hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it very clear to his disciples and to the others with whom he has contact that there's only one path, and that path to God is through him, that the path of religion has proven to fail, that the path of divination and seeking God through magical means has proven to fail, that the path of taking matters into your own hands and perhaps even taking your own life out of desperation and hopelessness has proven to fail. None of these paths have delivered for anyone. And so Jesus comes onto the scene and says, there is one path and I am here to present it to you. Well, this morning, we witness how the name of Jesus is shown to be superior to three paths to God, you could say which holds application for today as it did in its ancient setting. The name of Jesus means the Lord is salvation. Jehovah or Yahweh is salvation. In today's passage, we peer into the backstory of Paul's original journey to the city of Philippi, and we discover how the name of Jesus is invoked to confront these three pathways to God. Let's pray together. Father, help us to find in these lines and paragraphs and pages how your path confronts our many paths. How your path is superior to our many paths. How our idea, ideas, our choices, our own wisdom, our gut instinct, the advice of the experts we follow in our own head is always inferior to the path that you presented to us through Jesus. We want to thank you, God, that you have cleared up the confusion, that you have removed the other pathways and declared with authority Jesus is the way, that there is no other name under heaven whereby men may be saved. Help us to see that today in, the, in these texts. In Jesus' name, amen. Three pathways to God. The first pathway 
is the pathway of religion, the name of Jesus over the path of religion. Listen to these verses as Paul and his companions enter into the city of Philippi. It says in Acts chapter 16, verse 11, So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and following and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we remained in this city, Philippi, some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a, uh, a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from a city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I just want to stop before we read the conclusion of this little, this brief story. It says that Paul and his companions come to Philippi and they go toward the river where they suppose there is a place of prayer. And sure enough, as they're being directed by the Spirit, they come across a group of women praying on the river bank, and they come across a woman named Lydia. And the qualifier that's given, uh, this, the attribute that's given for this woman is she is a worshiper of God. And scholars think that she's perhaps a Greek who has now converted into Judaism and is, to, to some extent, and is trying to worship God through these new pathways she's learned. And it says, interestingly, after saying that she's a worshiper of God, which you and I would say, well, great, that's enough. Moving on to the next prayer group. Let's find people who aren't saved yet. But Paul stays there, and the text says that the Lord opened her heart to what was being said by Paul. So even though she's called a worshiper of God, something is missing in her understanding of who God is. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and in verse 15, and after she was baptized. I love the abruptness of that and how much, how much has taken place that the text doesn't even tell us about. We know what took place between the time Paul started talking and the time that she's now in the river she was praying beside being baptized. She has heard the name of Jesus. Her understanding of God and of the world and her newfound Judaism was incomplete. She did not know yet that Jesus had come to bore the weight of sin, to, in a way, fulfill all of the 613 laws of the Old Covenant through himself and through his sacrifice. After she was baptized and her household as well, She urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. Her attitude is one of excitement, and she insists that Paul and his companions come and stay at her place. Her world has been radically, radically changed. She hasn't just adopted a new ideology. She hasn't, like some of the sophists uh, in the Grecian culture, said, this is an interesting idea, I'll ponder this, I'll meditate on it, and after I've stewed over it for a while, I'll make my decision on what's the best way to live one's life. No, something abrupt and radical has entered into her heart that has completely changed this woman for God. She was a worshiper of God before. She was religious. She was no doubt legalistic in her religion, and now she has been set free by a higher truth, the highest truth. The pathway she was on may seem good to us from 30,000 feet, but it led to hopelessness. It led to despair. It led to a righteousness that was built up by oneself rather than a righteousness that is attributed to you, imputed to you by God through Jesus Christ, who has earned that place with God uh, through his humanity. And so her life has radically been changed. Some of us today in 2020, even those of us who've grown up in church and have heard the gospel our entire lives, some of us are stuck in some kind of general, non-specific worship of God. We want to say that we worship God, but we don't want to get too crazy about the worship of Jesus. We don't understand the connection and the role of God revealing himself through Jesus in the world. And so we opt for a religion that we can control. One where we say, 
Just like we look at our phone to see how many steps we've taken on our apps, we say, well, I've done my prayer, I have helped my neighbor, compared to all the rest of these people in this town, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good gal. We want to control the circumstances of our relationship with God. And the bizarre thing about it is we have no control whatsoever. It's a delusion. And I'll talk about that in the next point, this sense of control we think we have. What Lydia experienced in this passage was a loss of control for the glory of God. Her religion, her worship of God that she thought that she controlled, that she thought that she understood, was radically reinvented when the name of Jesus was invoked. If we look down at the next point, we see in the next little story in the text, the name of Jesus invoked over the path of divination. So if you'll look down at verse 16, and before I read this text, I wanted to explain what I mean by divination. Today, divination looks like tarot card reading. It looks like folk religion, um, trying to speak to the dead, um, uh, performing a seance. It's sort of folk religion mixed in with Um, pseudo witchcraft and it's an attempt really to access some truth beyond us that we feel like we can't get there so we want to talk to dead uh, relatives we want to study the stars and in the ancient world divination was uh, roundly practiced but also roundly condemned in the old testament god said you're not to you're not to practice divination you're not to read the stars in order to to find the will of the gods. You're not to take animal entrails and study the patterns of veins and lines, and this is what ancient Near Eastern people did in hopes that it would explain to them the will of the gods. You were to worship God in a particular way. So divination was something people would go to, and they would say, tell me about my future, and call upon the dead, and read the stars to me, and what do the patterns of the clouds tell us about what God wants me to do? God would rather communicate with his people directly, as he did in the Old Testament, and through his word, as he, do, as he has done through all time. So as we read this passage in verse 16, Paul says, as we were going to the place of prayer... We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and she brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. So this girl is a slave. She's possessed by a demon, and she has been, through this demonic possession, she has this ability to tell the future. Now, whether her future-telling was accurate or not, it's hard to say, but her masters were using her in order to gain financially uh, for themselves. So people would come in to find out what their future was, and they would pay a certain amount, and you can be assured that the slave girl was not getting a cut. She was being mastered both by the wicked men in her society society and by the demons who were inside of her and it says that this slave girl followed us around in verse 17 crying out these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation which you might think hey that's great we have a hype man we've got somebody following us around saying hey come to this sermon it's going to be great In reality, what this was doing was putting crosshairs on Paul and his companions, that they're preaching a gospel, something new, a new message that goes against the Judaism that would have been known by the people, and it goes against the paganism, and it goes against the the imperial cult that people would have known of, of worshiping, worshiping the emperor Nero as God and king. And so this girl is following them around saying, they worship the Most High God. And it says in verse 18, and it's kind of hilarious to me because it sounds like me talking to my kids, but uh, she kept doing this for many days and Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned to her and, and said in the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and that very hour it came out. But when her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. So the crowd joined in. And you can see this sort of mob mentality that you see on Facebook and Twitter today, uh, joining against Paul 
And it says the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, the jailer put them into the innermost part of the prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Okay, let's recognize that these men were not murdering people in the street, that Paul and his companions were not being violent to anyone. In fact, they were just walking around. And this girl filled with demons, with a spirit of divination, of future telling, of fortune telling, is proclaiming, these men proclaim the Most High God. And as a result, they're thrown into prison. But what's interesting is what Paul says to the girl. He says, back in verse 18, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Jesus Christ, his name invoked again. And now to cast demons out of a girl. And what the text doesn't go on to tell us is how the story of her life continues. But after these demons are exercised from her, if it follows any pattern we see in the gospel, she would come to know Christ as her Lord and Savior, having been changed radically by the experience of Jesus. Today, sometimes we, out of fear and out of a desire to access God, We'll try to take cheap, quick paths. And that may actually manifest for you in the form of going to try to get your palm read or following people who espouse forms of divination today and reading tarot cards or doing something else rather than going to God directly in prayer in the name of Jesus, which is how God has communicated to us, this is how you discover who I am. This is how you discover my will for you by speaking to me, by reading my word and allowing me to speak to you and through you. But the temptation and the fear for some of us is to take paths that we feel are validated by our own gut. On the low end of things, following a path of witchcraft or divination in our modern era will waste your time, your emotional energy, and a few other things. On the high end of things, it costs your soul. And so it's not something that we as Christians should ever engage in or think is a legitimate path to God. What happens is that you and I think that in our own ideas of God and in our own pathways to God, we have control over how far we go. And it's very much the mentality uh, that we would have if we're addicted to drugs. We think, I'm only going to go this far because I can control this much of it. But if it goes beyond that, I know it'll be out of control. So I'm just going to go this far. And so we create this delusion of control in our minds and in our lives. I am going to worship God the way I want to worship God. I'm going to follow him the way I'm going to, I want to follow him. And I'm going to believe he is whatever I want him to be. And in that process, we have prioritized ourselves as the chief authority on who God is when Jesus is that authority and he is communicated directly from his lips to us on these pages by the pen of scribes who he is and what he wants from us. So we turn. You may say that, uh, you know, you're not going to turn to divination anytime soon and that's a great thing to hear for me as your pastor. But there are other lesser forms where you and I think that we can speak to the dead, where you and I think that we can uh, find out God's path for our lives through silly things that we see around us in nature, never going to the source itself. C.S. Lewis talks about the man who loves going out into nature and experiencing God, which he affirms is an incredible thing to do. It's something I personally love to do, experiencing God while on a hike. But he says this man that he talks about, this hypothetical man, also hates uh, reading scripture. He doesn't, want to do, he doesn't want anything to do with theology. He doesn't want anything to do with what God's word actually says. And he says this man is like a man who sets out to the sea sets out to the midst of the ocean with no compass or map. At first, the birds, the air, the salt water, the excitement of it will be thrilling for him until eventually he has no idea where he is and he's desperate for answers. This incredible analogy is applicable to us when it comes to seeking pathways to God that aren't really from God. We see in the third part of this passage, in verses 25 through 34, that the name of Jesus is invoked over the path of peril. If the first two points 
it didn't hit home for you, perhaps this one will. All of us have either experienced depression and hopelessness and despair, or we have a close friend or a family member who has experienced it to the point of wanting to take their own life. The hopelessness that arises in us pre preaches a new gospel to us, and it tells us that you're not worth living, that your life is uh, useless to the rest of this earth, that the people around you don't need you, and that you're not important, and that you're not valuable. This message of the devil that he communicates to us in our hearts is so contradictory to everything that God has taught us about ourselves in Scripture that we should never take him seriously. But sometimes in our weakest moments, we do. And we think about things that we would never entertain otherwise, like the thought of taking our own life. Hopelessness and despair will lead us there. It'll lead us to stop believing what Genesis uh, chapter 1 teaches us, that God created us in his image that we are the unique product of God, to be like him in the earth, and that Jesus has redeemed us and bought us back to God so that we can be like him forever from one degree of glory to the next. But the lies that we breathe in and believe would have us believe that we're worthless, that it would be better for the world and for us if we weren't here. Listen to this passage in verse, 20, verse 25. The text says, about midnight, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're in solitary confinement, you could say. Their feet are in stocks. About midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison are being shaken, and immediately the doors are opened, and everyone's bonds are unfastened. And when the jailer woke up, he saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He turns his sword to his neck or back around to his own chest to slaughter himself. And what would lead a jailer to do something like that? Killing himself would be a greater mercy than suffering the punishment he might have and the dishonor he might have at the hands of his Roman uh, leaders in this society. These people escaping, there's no way he can catch them all. And if just one escapes, that could cost that jailer's life. So he turns the sword on himself. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and his whole family. And then he brought them up to his house to set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Three people sitting in a Bible study with you as you are a first century Greek person, man or woman, who has come to know Christ as Savior. This first woman says, I thought I was worshiping God, I was exalting myself, but now I know Christ. The second woman, I thought I could see visions of the gods and what they would do in the earth, but then I discovered Christ. And the third person, this Philippian jailer, says, I had no hope in my life. So I turned my sword to my own throat, and then I heard the name of Jesus invoked. In this passage, Paul's first, ex his, his greatest experience here at Philippi demonstrates the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ as invoked over other pathways to God. And we find at the conclusion of this passage that none of those pathways led to God and that it's true what Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? With which of these three individuals do you identify yourself? Become like them, going from death to life everlasting because of the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, it's, it's absolutely thrilling for us to read these words. 
and to see how your love was extended to people who thought they were religious, to people who were possessed by demons and utterly hopeless and rejected, to people who thought it would be better to take their own lives than to live another second under the dishonor of society. You have demonstrated that the love that you have for them is worthy of saving them. And through Christ, you bought them. I pray, Lord, that now in our weakness and in our brokenness and in our fear that we experience now in life, that we would recognize the authority of the name of Jesus. Yahweh saves. Jehovah saves. God is salvation. And that we would take the path that's been given to us, knowing that there is no other name under heaven whereby we will be saved but the name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jordan. Our closing hymn this morning is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. just want to encourage you once again, I'm not sure how many weeks in a row we've been doing this, but remain faithful to the Lord, remain faithful to your family and your brothers and sisters in Christ and your neighbors in the midst of this pandemic, and listen for what God would tell you about how you can serve him better as we wait well by preparation and meditation, leaning on our, our walk with Christ uh, during a time of, of anger and frustration and building uh, resentment and also just um, sadness as people have lost their lives. Uh, and, and I encourage, you to see, encourage you to come in next week. Um, uh, don't come in the building, actually. <laughs> I encourage you to join us online next week um, as, we, as we continue this series with Philippians and we start with chapter 1. Let me close us in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you together. Uh, we pray for your wisdom throughout this week coming. And uh, that you and uh, that you, God, would would speak to us about uh, where our priorities lie. That you'd speak to us about ways in which we have uh, viewed you in our own. Uh, we've sort of created you on our own image rather than being created in your image. Uh, how we have sought to control you and put you in a box and 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 order and order our religion a certain way rather than saying, God, what would you have to say to us? And God, we, we invoke the name of Jesus Christ over our life right now, uh, over the troubles that we face, God, but also the sin that we battle, uh, that you'd be victorious in it. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.